So one of the things that I did with Will and the guys after I got in the band, the first thing I wanted to do was work to a click. Playing to a click, not everybody can do that. A lot of bands will avoid doing that. Yeah. But, the, but it's great for it when you want to edit. And because I've been in the studio so many years, I understand the advantage of playing with a click. And a lot of times, it's easy to play fast, but play slow. Yeah. Doug, thank you so much for coming by. We just saw each other recently. Yes. At a performance with Living Color. Mm -hmm. you, you guys sounded so great. The audience was intensified. You're you. still doing this at an incredible pace. Thank you so much for joining Thanks. us. Well, I appreciate being here as well. Where, you were just where now? I'm just coming back from Whitehorse, Canada, which is in the Yukon Territory, <laughs> about 700 miles east of Anchorage, Alaska. And I was there with Bernard Fowler, my good friend mm -hmm. from Packhead, and he's working with the Rolling Stones. Uh, Brian Tishy, another yes. drummer, well, great drummer. Great, great drummer. And Stevie Silas. Mm. And uh, yeah, we had a great time. We were there playing for a fundraiser for Indian Reservation for Clarity, performing and also attending the documentary Rumble, which will be coming out early next year, mm. that Stevie Silas and Christina Fawn are the a couple of the uh, producers of this amazing documentary on the Native American Indians that were influential in rock and roll. Fantastic. Very, very cool. Boy, this is going to be very, very exciting. So look out for that. You are involved in so many things. You always have been involved in many, many things. Just tell me down the beginning, where did music start for you? How did music enter your life? I just started early. You know, uh, my father is African, Native American, mm -hmm. and my mother's from the Bahamas. So I had this Creole fusion of frequencies going on at a very young age. Uh, I have an older sister and an older brother. I was, you know, that third child that was hanging out and listening to see what they were doing. So for me, it started off with record collections that were in the house. Mm. My father was a photographer, so he documented a lot of stuff, mm. but he was also a vivid record collector. So when I was coming up, I'd see all these 78 records and you know, and I was like, what's that? Oh man, so you know, kind of like, uh, this is very interesting. And then my mom's record collection was, was coming from the Bahamas. So I would see all these kind of like Bahamian records that looked kind of uh, colorful to me. My friends would come over and go, Who's, what's, what's up with these records? Who's those <laughs> folks and natives on the album covers and stuff? And so I had this fusion going on. You know, my earliest recollection of listening, of hearing music and being turned on to stuff was, you know, obviously what I was hearing in the household. But then when I, you know, about four or five years, three to four years old, you start, you know, AM radio, what's coming on the radio yeah. and listening to see and what's activating my older brother and older sister, you know, so I'm just, you know, following in their footsteps, you know, the twist is coming out with Chubby Checker. I'm trying, I'm trying to twist, and, you know, at the same time, you know, my mother's native music from the Bahamas, uh, the Eloise Trio, uh, you know, or Ronnie Butler coming from Nassau, yeah. the indigenous music that was there, I was listening to simultaneously. So either, you know, the Rolling Stones are coming on the radio with, you know, with Keith Richards' fuzz or Brian Jones' guitar to listening to early Motown. You know, at the same time, the whole jazz scene was going on. So I'm listening to John Coltrane, and Miles Davis, and so on and so forth. So I was fortunate coming from Hartford, Connecticut, listening to the hybrid of music that was going on mm. in a classic uh, New England city was where it all started for me. And I just merged on. I just kind of like was sucking it all in, trying to emulate things. Yeah. As a young kid, you know, just trying to find a way to enjoy the music that was there, not knowing that at some point I would become this musician, you know, that's how things happen in life. It just flowers. Absolutely. It just flowers. How beautiful and how natural. When did bass enter the picture? Well, I always was attracted to bass. I was always attracted to drums, rhythm, yeah. bass. Yeah. Why? Because I would go to a event uh, or there would be a party or, a, you know, because a lot of times everybody did things in their house, you know, yeah, and then yeah. what was going on in the school or church. As Say, for example, I would get closer to a church function and I, what, what's the, you know, I'd hear music, what's the first thing you hear? You hear the bass, because yeah. the bass wave is, penetrates. Yeah. 
And I'm like, why am I? Okay, what is that? And as I, it was a Doppler effect. So as I got closer, I'd hear the bass, and then I'd hear a little bit of tickering going on. It might be the hi-hat or something <laughs> else. So I was attracted to the rhythms of drums mm -hmm. and the bass drum and how it kind of like just, you know, the drums would come on, people just start moving around, you know, <laughs> wiggling and stuff. And then the bass going with that was something that created this frequency that I was just attracted to. Yeah. How did I get into bass? Well, it was almost like I was absorbing things all at the same time. So I have to kind of break it down like this. The first instrument that I was able to get my hands on was a mandolin, yeah. right? And that was, let's just say, it was gifted by my next door neighbor who uh, were, were school teachers. And that came about by, you know, in Connecticut, or probably a lot of states, there would be a day where you could get rid of all your stuff that's in the basement, refrigerator, dresser, yada, 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 and a truck from this town would come by and pick up the heavy stuff, the heavy lifted. <laughs> so as kids, we'd get on our bikes and ride around to see who's throwing out whatever, right? Did that, and that became a thing. You know, basically, we're, we're just rummaging in garbage. <laughs> and, but, it was, but it was a lot of people at that time were, were getting rid of some interesting things. Come back one evening after going around, and my sister and I went the next door neighbor. They put out their goods and going through it. My sister pulls out a banjo. I pull out a mandolin. <laughs> Happened to be a 1918 Gibson mandolin, and I didn't even know that. It's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. So that was my first instrument. I grabbed that, asked my mom if it was okay if I had it. She was like, well, Douglas, go back and make sure that Mr. and Mrs. Woods didn't make a mistake <laughs> and see if it was okay if you could have it. You know, just it's what families did. So I went next door, knocked on the door, and said, Mr. and Mrs. Woods, is it okay if I have this instrument? Sure. That was my first instrument, a mandolin. So banging around, not knowing what I was doing, you know, eventually I'm emulating stuff on the radio and, you know, trying to play the theme from the man from uncle or <laughs> whatever stuff that I heard. And eventually eight strings come on a mandolin. One would go one week, month, another string would go. <laughs> two weeks, two months later, yada, I ended up with four strings. <laughs> so let's just say that might have been the early fundamental of bass yeah, for me, playing sure. a four-stringed sure, instrument. Sure. Fast forward, now we're in the days of the Vietnam War happening, you know, growing up in Bloomfield, Connecticut, my next door neighbor, he went to Vietnam, he would send his brother back little artifacts and trinkets that were coming. So, a little amplifier, guitar, and a Jimi Hendrix poster and a suede vest. So we'd, <laughs> we'd sit up and, you know, put on Hendrix records and act like we were playing it. Woodstock, you know, cranking things up until you heard a bang on the door, turn that stuff down from the parents and stuff like that. So, you know, and then, a, then like these little bass came one time. So I was borrowing and using yeah. neighbors and friends instruments before I was actually able to have an electric guitar. So I started playing guitar first a little bit. Mm -hmm. Started actually taking lessons from one of my sister and brother's uh, friends, Eddie Bailey. At that time, there were so many guitar players because you had this serious rock movement going on from just from the 50s and 60s. Now where I'm like, this must have been like 67. You just start trying to play a few chords here. And, start and then next thing you know, a few years go by, I take some lessons. Then I get a guitar. But I did, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that was gifted. I had to mow the lawn or wash dishes or shovel the snow. You worked for it. I worked for yeah. it. Right? And next thing you know, I buy a guitar from the same person who started to give me some lessons. So I'm playing, 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 and there were so many guitar players at the time, so many guitar players, and I was also playing, fiddling around with bass as well. Yeah. So I, would, I was pl playing bass and guitar kind of like at the same time trying to learn. And basically, my friend Eddie was like, you know what? I, I, got, I started playing bass, so, you know, here, play, play bass a little bit, and I'll teach you some songs. Mm -hmm. Basically what he was doing was he was teaching me his re repertoire. You know, and, uh, you know, my mother gave him a few dollars here just to show me stuff. But really, he was just like, he was, he was kind of like, okay, here, you, can, you got a good ear. Why don't you start to play some bass? So I started to play bass with the elders. And then with my peer group and kids, I was playing guitar 
and bass. Why? Because there was a million guitar players in my community. Mm -hmm. And because the jazz guitar player did not want to hang out with the rock and roll guitar player, who didn't want to hang out with the, the funk guitar player, who didn't want to play with the rhythm guitar player. I'm only playing lead. I'm playing Led Zeppelin. There's a lot of musical police officers out there that I, that I, that I noticed early. And I'm trying to walk between the sonic raindrops of just trying to get the information. So, that's, so bass was kind of something that I, I always loved the bass, always loved the frequency. Back to the drums, what I heard, back to you know, going to events. And I was, and I said, you know what? I'm, I'm very comfortable with this instrument, so I'm, I want to become a bass player. Mm -hmm. And it was almost just a matter of, you know, kind of, I def not necessarily defaulted, but because I, c I was learning from musicians that were in my community. There were, there was only one Mel Bay bass book that was out. <laughs> I didn't really read music, so I'm learning from the guitar players that didn't play with each other. They were the ones that were my mentors. Just, it was all local, Dom. It was yeah. all local musicians that I was learning from. How beautiful. Well, it sounds like fate had a certain hand in this as far as guiding you toward that instrument, which was fantastic. Were you taking lessons and learning you know, uh, uh, specifics about techniques at all? or Well, half the lessons were, the first lesson I learned was how to listen mm. and how to be able to being accepted by some of, my, some of the elders mm. and being able to listen yeah. and be cool and not be aggravating to the <laughs> elders. So I kind of, that, the, the first lesson was how to listen and how to actually, I was watching kind of like the attitudes that different people had and learned how, okay, don't want to do that, don't want to do that, I want to do that. So it was a, it was a calm listening first, yeah. you know, and that gave the elders that I was working with the comfort of like, okay, this little kid is cool. Mm -hmm. Kind of like I had to kind of win them over by just being poised enough and calm enough to, to, okay, no, let him sit through the rehearsals. He's cool while the other kids are out playing ball, which I like to do as well. <laughs> but it was, it's like, you have to be accepted yeah. by the, el yeah. by the, yeah. by the elders, you know, and an elder to me at that time is anybody four years older might have a mustache and <laughs> you know, old big afro and stuff. So I had to learn how to deal with that. With that came, you know what, you know what, you're cool. Listen, man, here's the deal. You know, um, you know how to set a drum kit up? Yeah. Okay, cool. Turn the amp on. Okay, you know how to wrap some cables? Yeah, okay. Well, you know that you learn how to do that. Why don't you know, here, let me plug in, a, plug in this bass, play my bass. Mm -hmm. Here's how you play Pneumonia by Cooling the Gang. <laughs> Here's how you do a James Brown song. So it became a way and means for me to communicate through the elders and by them being comfortable enough to be able to say, hey, we got this little kid here, and they start pumping information yeah. into me. So there was no Berkeley, there was no <laughs> inf stuff, schools like that that I had access to. It was, there was, the access came from the locals, what was on television, Don Krishner's rock, rock concert or oh, whatever, right, or, sure. or you know, Dick Cavett's show that's coming on, the Ed Sullivan show, Woodstock was a big change where you could actually see Jimi Hendrix hands real big. So it all came from the influence of what we had to work with in my area yeah, and yeah. what was on the radio. And then I started to just kind of, I just picked it up and, and, and I was encouraged by my elders, hey man, play, here's, here's another song. And I felt special. Yeah. I felt like, you know, when you're 11 yeah, or yeah, 12 yeah. and I'm hanging out with 18 year old and guys yeah, yeah. that are coming back from Vietnam and yeah. stuff like that. So I felt like I was privileged to be around these elders. Absolutely, and that acceptance from someone who's older yeah. There's a certain value in that yeah. that is really a good boost for yeah, a young kid. It yeah. really yeah. helped me out. It yeah. gave me confidence. Yeah. And it gave, but it also, I pass, as I was learning it, I was also passing it down yeah. to the folks that were my age. So I wasn't like this little cocky kid, yeah, I mean, look at, have some of this. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And yeah. No, I was like, man, hey, man, listen, here's some information I'm learning. So I'm, there would be other kids that I knew that can play, and, you know, and, and they had certain skills. I'm like, yo, check this out. And then they, we shared from mm. each other. How so beautiful. that's how it was. How beautiful. So you, you're playing with all these, you've got a lot of different influences. How did the professional career then start? I'll tell you a story, and I'll lead into that. I hope I don't take too much time. Back that's to the Bahamas. Yeah. Back to my mom, my mother's family. I would spend summer vacations in Nassau. I have young uncles, 
And I have one uncle who passed, God bless his soul, Joey, who was, um, played a little guitar. And I'd sit and, you know, I was learning how to still play a little bit, so I'd sit on the porch and strum guitars. Now, meanwhile, there's no television station. It's only one radio station yeah, there, yeah, yeah. 120 miles from, from Miami. But it was this great community. So in Nassau, there's many musicians that, that were there because they're playing in the hotels. And I was able to meet a lot of young, I mean, a lot of great musicians there. When I was young, I had a big afro <laughs> and I had a premature mustache, right? So now my, you know, the Jackson 5 comes out. I'm coming from America. Bell-bottom pants, have that look. And my uncles would usher me around and they'd be like, yeah, here's, here's, here's my American nephew. Yeah, I'm on, here's my American nephew, mine here, cool. So then, my, then the Jackson 5 comes out, album covers and stuff like that. So my uncles came up with the bright idea of telling people I was Jermaine Jackson in the Jackson 5. But Dom, the best part about it is, they believed. <laughs> so they did, a, they did a little test. So they would just take me, big afro, they would just go, don't say anything. I'll just talk. Take me to a nightclub. Yeah, man, this is Jermaine Jackson and the Jackson 5. They'd be, really? Because there's, no, there's no real proof of what. <laughs> so, yeah, man. So they would usher me in to a club. And I'm 12. And you can see where people have already been sitting down, having a great time at the table. Heineken beers and Guinness Stout and Planters Punch or whatever. So they moved them out of the way and put me right in front of the bandstand. And then my uncles would go, don't say anything. Guinness Stout! And they just start ordering drinks and stuff like that. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, man, I'm in a friggin' nightclub. And my, my mother, their, their sister knew what they were doing, she'd skin them alive. But it worked. So then that became a little kind of like, you know, thing for my uncles to go around telling people so that they could drink and hang out and beat girls. So I'm 12 years old in a nightclub that never would have happened. I'd have been arrested here. And so that went on and people were like, hey man, it became a little bit of a thing, right? So then I'd come back the next year and they'd start the same. I go there for summer vacations. So anyway, and I came back home and I'm playing a little bit. And I said, you know what? This is great. Either I'm going to spend my, the rest of my life impersonating a fraud or I want to become a professional musician. And also my mother's best friend on Bay Street in Nassau owned a furniture store, an appliance store, and on one side and on the other side was a music store. So during the siesta times, because it would be very hot, she trusted me. She was like, I'm going to get to go to lunch. Here's the key. Just take care of the shop. So I had the whole music store to myself. So as these as things started to stack in my, in my, in my, in, and I'm just like, why is he okay? Well, you know, I'm playing a little bit. I'm learning, I'm in nightclubs, I'm actually in a music store, I'm actually able to now play a Fender bass, play around the, with the guitar, you know, Telecaster, whatever. So, I'm, so I came back to America and I made a decision, I wanna make this part of my life. I wanna be a musician and make a living. So now you're in high school, you're meeting other musicians now, are you starting to play with other musicians? Well, yeah, I mean, I was playing sports. So I'm, you know, playing, you know, the pep rally and at school and stuff like that. But I'm still playing. I'm still also working with my elders, like mm -hmm. my friend Eddie Bailey, who gave me the lessons. At one point, I was, you know, playing sports, but I was also still taking lessons. So my good friend who started me off, Eddie Bailey, witnessed and saw what I was doing. So another spark was he invited me to play at a nightclub mm -hmm. when I was 13 years old. After, you know, and at that nightclub, um, you know, I was able to have another life experience. And I'll make this very short. And that life experience was this. He has showed me his sets, his songs. He said, you know what? You're ready to play a gig. I'm like, really? He's 13 years old. I know he's playing at a club. It's like we're doing a mat matinee show in the daytime. Why don't you come and play that? I said, well, what's up with your bass player? He said, well, the bass player is a pimp. So he's not able to make the mat matinee shows. <laughs> So, so really, so I see him driving around town with his you know, big Cadillac, and white walls. And stuff. So I'm like, "You sure?" He said, "Yeah, come to the come to the club, and you know, I'll um, we'll rehearse." I said, "Okay, you sure?" He said, "Yeah." So I go to the club, going over the songs. Twenty minutes in, who walks through the door? The pimp, long cocaine fingernails. I could hear his muffler outside. He's got his woman in the car. She comes in later on, big long leather coat, pimped out hair. He's a bass player. He comes in, hey, Dom, how you doing, man? What's going on? You might have been the drummer, guitar player, slaps him five on the hand. What's going on, man? Yo, keyboard player. He just looks at me. 
doesn't say anything. <laughs> and he gives me that real pimp look. I'm like, oh, here we go. So anyway, I'm like, these are the, these are the highlights of my life. You know what I mean? These yeah. are the things that you go yeah. through. So I'm like, okay. So the guys, they, so, I, so I pack up my stuff. And Eddie Bailey, the guitar player, leader of the band, is, he sees me. He said, I'm about to go home. He said, no, 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 no. You just go sit in the corner and watch. It's okay. It's almost more, he's pouring more oil on the pimp because, yeah. you know, I'm like, oh, this is great. <laughs> so they're rehearsing, yada, yada, going through some songs. And, I'm, and that, meanwhile, he's smiling at everybody else. But it looks like, when I get out of this car, when I get out of this club, I'm <laughs> taking your head off. So anyway, fast forward, I'm like, I'm looking at the guy and I'm like, you know what? He's going to probably run me over in his car when he sees me. Can take it. So anyway, I'm like, you know, and I'm, so I'm holding it down. So rehearsal's over. He's got his bass in his hand. I'm like, I got to try to say something to this guy and not be a wimp, but still, you know, hold my ground, but just, you know, break the ice as musicians do. So, I, you know, he's sitting around playing this groove by Cool and the Gang, and I already knew the song. And I said, let me just say something to him, you know. So I go up to him. I'm like, hey, man, um, sound great, man. He's got the bass out. And he's like, uh, I said, hey, man, would you, I'm a little kid. He said, hey, would you mind showing me this little lick? He said, get out of here, little kid. I'm not showing you. So at that point, that was another thing that took place in my life where I said, you know, and I felt really bad, but I held it down. I didn't show any signs of weakness. And my other, the eldest, like, hey, man, don't do that. I'm like, it's, it's cool. So I just, you know, packed my stuff up. And I said, you know what? I'll never be like that guy. I'll show anybody anything for the rest of my life. Great so it's, it's these kind of things yeah. before you play the notes yeah. that I experienced to be able to understand how to play the notes and how to express myself and also how to share the notes. Right on. Right and that's really what it's all about. That's fantastic. Well, it's interesting because now at this point, you're in high school. I'm in high school. You jam with musicians. Jamming with musicians. Who were you listening to? Who, who, who you Everybody and everything. Anything that was coming across. Now FM radio is out now. Yeah. So now I'm listening to all the stuff in stereo and I'm listening to everything because because at that time there was a there was a lot of division, you know. Either look, man, I'm, I'm listening to you know Oscar Pettiford, I'm listening to Charlie Mingus, I'm listening to Miles Davis again, and yada yada. So my brother and sister had a had a large jazz collection. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening to that. Then I meet. Then I'm listening to Jackie McLean, who was local here or there. Yeah. He was in Hartford. And I'm also listening to I'm listening to Hendrix, Sly and the Family Stone, Funkadelic. Jimi Hendrix, Grand Funk Railroad. I'm listening to The Stones, The Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Tito Puente, the family of all stars, on and on. You know, I'm listening to Osibisa, you know, all these, all these different artists that yeah. are going on, right? So, and there was a, like, again, the, you had your jazz heads that were hardcore, and they were like, yo, man, you couldn't swing if you were hanging from a rope. <laughs> you know, and you had all this kind of lingo and yeah. stuff going on. Yeah. Then you had the guitar players are all competing against each other, and I'm like, this is amazing. You know, everybody, why can't we all just play together? <laughs> but at the same time, it was important that I understood the lane and understood how to not get caught in the, again, back to the musical police officers, there's a lot of music, there are a lot of musical police officers out there, cats are like, yo man, just play funk. Yeah. I'm listening to funk, I'm listening yeah. to Bootsy. I would see Bootsy playing at the Springfield Music Hall with James Brown playing a 30 minute set, you know what I mean, with Catfish and, and, you know, and stuff like, so I'm watching and seeing all these things, and I was just, I just wanted to absorb it all in. And also mm -hmm. like sound, I liked, you know, opening up my mother's my fa and father's stereo system, like big cab, and they opened up the lid, and then they had an additional speaker, and then FM radio would come out in stereo. I love the sound of stereo. I loved the listening to a Jimi Hendrix's first records because it was in this vivid stereo imagery. Yeah. So it's not just the music. Good it's I was listening to the sound of it. Stairway to Heaven, the middle section, Bonham going into, you know, all this. I'm like, this is freaking great. <laughs> it's the sound of it all. As much as it was the notes, it's the sound. Why did it, I know that was John Coltrane after four notes? It's the sound. It's the shape of his note. Miles. Mm -hmm. Miles played a different frequency. You had Charlie Bird, and mm -hmm. you know, and you had all these, and Miles mm -hmm. found his own lane. How do you find your lane? Yeah, yeah. How do you find, you know, how do you, so, it, so I was developing, I was, I, was, I was learning the vocabulary, but I was also not getting caught up with the musical police officer. It was your best friends. 
your mates. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so this is probably a great way that led you into your sound, because you have a very distinctive sound in how you play. How'd you discover that? When I was coming up, again, look, we were, um, we were kids, so we were, you know, you know, little amps would be there, and we didn't know what we were doing. Just turn it up and get, I just wanted, you know, here's distortion. Fine, yeah, sounds good to me. Here's a nice Vox guitar with a built-in palm wah-wah and a vibrato and stuff like that. And I'm listening to Kenny Burrell or Wes Montgomery. Yeah. I like that tone. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the flat wound strings. Then I'm listening to, you know, you know, James Brown and the grooves and how everything syncs up. And I'm listening to pre-James Brown before he went to Africa and post-James Brown after he came back Big from Africa. Yeah. So I'm listening to these things yeah. and my subconscious is kind of like going, man, you know, why is it I'm attracted to the pure, the pure notes and I'm also attracted to things that are distorted or a wah-wah or a flanger or a phaser or an echo? and stuff like that. So, 1970 came around, things started to develop more and more, where a wah-wah pedal is in development. It is, here's a wah-wah pedal that you actually could get your hands on. Yeah. Here's a fuzz, here's a flange, here's a phaser, here's an echoplex. Again, I'm around this community where there's a lot of players that are kind of like experimenting with stuff. So I would hang out with the guys that are experimenting. <laughs> this guy just got a Mutron. I'm like, that's great. You know, and he's a, and the guy that got the Mutron is a killer, Kenny Burrell, Wes Montgomery fanatic. Yeah. So not only can he play G George Benson and all those things, he's also experimenting with sounds. Mm -hmm. You saw it was like the duality was going on. And I just absorbed it. So I was like, you know, okay, um, bands were rehearsing my, in, um, my, in our basement sometimes. So I, you know, just watched it, watch cats play and stuff. And I was fascinated by the sound of yeah. it all. It's just like, here's a guitar straight, here's a guitar through wah wah, here's a guitar with a, somebody taking a, a screwdriver and punching a hole in the speaker and getting fuzz out of it. Yeah. I don't have a fuzz pedal, but I'll make that amp sound fuzzy. <laughs> and, you know, so, we're so I'm a kid. I'm trying to emulate what we hear without yeah. the assets of, of, of being able to go in. And, you know, there was no Manny's. There yeah. was, you know, it was yeah. local music stores. Yeah. A lot of them were geared for, you know, bands and marching bands or, you know, whatever. I like sound. Yeah. And I, so I borrow my friend's bass, one of my guys that I was taking lessons from, a little Fender Mustang, nylon strings. And he was like, yeah, he was just, just hold on to it for what a matter of fact. Borrow my Mutron. Matter of fact, here's an Echoplex. Nice. Is it so I plug it all in? I was playing with this. <laughs> I was playing with an. My setup when I was a kid, not knowing what I was doing in 1971, was an Echoplex, Phase 90. Um, whenever they came out, don't 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 yeah, don't, the, don't around that yeah, time. Yeah, around yeah, yeah. Wawa pedal. Yeah. Fuzz, and you had these fuzz Wawas at the same time. <laughs> now I'm playing straight with some cats because I knew that you know that's kind of what they wanted. Yeah. But with other things, I'm trying to emulate stuff through these sounds. So I always incorporated the sound. I'm just trying to be a kid. Yeah. I'm, like a, I'm like a parrot trying to emulate the sounds <laughs> that I heard. Well, you seem to really do well with it because it started to create and open up different sounds that you then adapted to different musical situations. Again, I'm listening to Sly and the Family Stone's Sex Machine. That song alone, you have a wah-wah going out of a voice or a harmonica, and then you have the distinct frequencies of just rhythm. And, Sl and Larry Graham playing, you know, fuzz and oh, distortion yeah. on yeah. bass and stuff like that. I'm like, why wouldn't I? You know, so that sounds great to me. <laughs> so I was, I wanted to emulate them. Then comes, you know, Bootsy coming out and he's funking it up. And I'm listening to Jocko Pistorius, you know what I mean? When by the time I got to that point, it was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, so it was such great music that I, I was fortunate to grow up at a great time of music. Yeah. And it was just diversity and it was originality. So I just absorbed it, and as I was given the opportunity to play with either my own bands or whatever, I incorporated the bass. But mm. I'm the effect. You could take all those pedals away, yeah. give me one string, and give me a, you know, and I'm happy. <laughs> so that's kind of how, that was my mentality. I wasn't, I wasn't kind of just dependent on that because, I, you know, I, I knew the lane. Yeah. And I also knew how to be patient enough to continue what I liked, yeah. but give people what they like. So all this is building up now. So how did Living Color come about? How did that all begin to formulate? Oh, that's interesting. You know, Vernon and I met in New York City, like probably like around 1980. This is now I had already done this, you know, 
I had gone through working at All Platinum Records. I started off as a studio musician in 1974 with my elders. Uh, and I was in the band Wood, Brass and Steel. That's Sylvia Robinson. Mm -hmm. And Sylvia was part of Mickey and Sylvia for Mickey Baker. Right. And they had a huge hit, Love is Strange. Love is Strange was the, one of the most played records before the Beatles came. So I was fortunate to meet these elders. Right. And I worked my way up the ranks as a studio musician. We had a band Wood, Brass and Steel. Yada, phase one. That went on from 74 to 79. Rapper's Delight comes out. Right. Now the same company. Now I'm doing all the hip hop stuff. Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Funky Four Plus One, Sequence, yada, yada. That blows up, hit after hit after hit. So now Vernon was, I'm living in New York, and Vernon was kind of like, we met at a session that I was producing some songs for the artist that wrote part of the message. Uh, it's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. So I did those records. That artist, Duke Booty, Columbia, Columbia University, you know, scholar, teaching school in Elizabeth, New Jersey, knew Vernon. Now he's doing his own solo record off the heels of the success of the message. And, you know, so now we're in 1982, something like that. So I wrote a few songs for him, produced some stuff. And then it was like, you know what, this one song, I had this one song, Same Day Service. It was like a... It was like this real boom was like this kind of like real twisted you know rhythm at first into this funk rhythm and then but Fletcher with new Vernon Reed from you know Shannon Jackson he was like I got a guitar player man that might be good to put a solo on that that's who Vernon Reed I see I heard of Vernon we hadn't met yet so he brings Vernon in the studio to play on a track that I wrote and produced at Fletcher <laughs> And then Vernon loved the songs. He loved the intro of the same day service. He's a, you know, he's a, you know, he like, cause it had this really eclectic kind of yeah. twisted rhythm going on. And that's how we met. So fast forward, you know, Vernon was, you know, we talked to each other and he was really, really, really trying to get put on at Sugar Hill. Cause Sugar Hill was, we were, we were cutting a lot of hits. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, we started start chatting. He's like, hey man, I love to do something at Sugar Hill. Cool, man, okay, cool. So bring him to Sugar Hill one day. <laughs> Was, it's interesting because um, I'm not sure if Tito Puente was here, but because uh, at Sugar Hill, a lot of artists went through Tito Puente. We cut with as it as you know, playing percussion. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie's on one of the songs. <laughs> so anyway, I bring him there. But at Sugar Hill, when you're cutting hits, right, and we cut a lot of hits, you don't want to mess with the formula. It's like you leave it the way it is. Right. So I bought you know. So we had this. I, we were, at this time, the rhythm section you know was doing a few different things. We we're working a lot. Keith LeBlanc, Skip McDonald. Skip is the one that got me in the, in the industry. So I invite Vernon to the studio. He comes there. We're a little late because we're doing two sessions at the same time. Out with Chris Lord Algy doing some stuff over here, down the hill because Sugar Hill had two studios. So Vernon's there. So by the time we get there, Sylvia's there. And she's, you know, she's like Vernon's gagging to play. <laughs> Sylvia wouldn't let him play. She's like, oh, that's, 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 hi, nice, nice to meet your friend. Where's Skip? <laughs> <laughs> the original guitar player, because she's like, nah, it's not having it. Highlights disappointment, but that's the truth of what took place. Interesting. So he never got a chance to play on it. But then Vernon and I were still friends, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> he was doing these events in New York where he was putting together different bands to play for events. You know, different different members and different players and stuff like that. So, he had this one gig where I think I subbed for another bass player. He has an event at the Limelight that he was doing. No, it might have been, there was two, a couple of events. The Limelight, let's just say we had a gig at the Limelight. That was a great gig. He put, a, put together a killer band. All of the elite up-and-coming New York musicians that were, were down with this. So, we became tight. I was living in London at that time as well. I was going back and forth, and yada, yada. So in 1984, I was working with Tom Silverman at the same time from Tommy Boy Records and, and was recording a song with my third cousin, James Brown. James Brown, Africa Bambada, did a record called Unity, and then the four SMDs, yada, yada. So I'm doing stuff there. And I'm also, I also had met Adrian Sherwood in London. Started to go to the UK, doing stuff over there. Yeah. So anyway, boom, boom, boom. Vernon, we had a place on 14th Street. Vernon was, also, was, was a writer at that time at the um, Village Voice. He's doing some stuff over there in the radio show. He would, I would invite him by uh, Keith LeBlanc's apartment, Skip, and my, our, our place that we shared. So we were right on the corner of 14th and, and 6th. So Vernon would come by, hang out. And he was talking about, man, you know, 
we had this band Tackhead, we were already up and running. It's like, man, I want to, you know, I'm thinking about putting together a band, you know, and it was, it was at that time, it was putting, he was putting together Vernon Reed's Living Color mm. with different folks. So that's kind of how it started. So I kind of met Vernon early before I met Will and, and Corey. Yeah. So fast forward, I'm in the UK cutting. I, I got a gig with Jeff Beck and I'm working with Simon Phillips, Jeff Beck, Jan Hammond. Did a tour with them. Jeff recommends me to, be a, to do Mick Jagger's solo record. And I met Mick Jagger with Arthur Baker because I'm doing a lot of stuff. Did this Sun City project with um, Little Steve and Yadia. So I'm kind of like, you know, in these different communities. So I'm not just in one community. I'm in this I have a English vibe going on. I got the, my hip hop <laughs> stuff going on. Now I'm in this rock field with Little Steven and Arthur Baker, and I'm doing all these remixes and stuff. I meet Mick Jagger, do you know yada yada. So fast forward, um, I ended up auditioning for Mick Jagger, and I get the gig. Went up against 40 bass players between New York, LA, and London, but I got the gig. Fantastic. I didn't really care. <laughs> I'm not really brown nose and maker kind of like interested. In I just kind of like was natural. Yeah. Just went in. At that audition, Vernon auditioned as, as well. He was, he was here, he put together Living Color, and he's got something going on. But he auditioned as well. He didn't get the gig, I got the gig. And one day at rehearsal, Mick comes up to me, and he's like, he knew Vernon. It's like, Dougie, you know, what do you think about Living Color? You know, I, I like the band. I said, yeah, 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 Vernon's my mate. He's really cool. He, he kind of knew Vernon, but didn't know Vernon. Yeah. So I'm like, heck, matter of fact, uh, he said, I'm thinking about, you know, I'd like to go check them out. I said, well, they're playing at CBGB's. Why don't you go, you and Jeff, go check them out. Go see them at CBGB's. Cool. So he comes back the next day and he said, hey, Dougie, I, I like the guys, man. What, what do you think? What do you think? I I'd like to do something with them. I said, you're Mick Jagger, man. You busted all these blues caps. You take them in the studio and do something with them. And he did. So on my recommendation, Part of my recommendation I was out, you know, at that time, Ed Stacian was the engineer. And he was like, you know what, Ed, would you mind, maybe I'd like to come in and do a demo or something like that with, with the lads. And so that's how it happened, in a sense, you know what I mean? So I was indirectly, but directly influential in putting, in, in co-signing. How interesting. You know, yeah, sure. Mick, Mick Jagger going in, because at that time I had auditioned he had one band already in place. He got rid of everybody, and I'm the only one he kept. So he trusted me. Yeah. So I was, and this is the truth. It's not, yeah. it's not, I'm not saying this to say whatever. You know, it's just this is the facts of what took place. And being a friend, you know, I was not the kind of person that was, I had my own band. I could have been like, screw Living yeah. Color. What about Tackhead? Because he liked Tackhead <laughs> yeah, as well. Right. I'm like, no, you're, so, you're showing some shine to Vernon. He's a mate. And I loved the band. Mm. And I thought for Mick Jagger to be able to produce a Vernon and Living Color or something like that would be good for everybody. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what, so next thing you know, one thing leads to another. They're in the studio, boom, boom. And then, you know, they get put on. It took Mick a while to get the band signed. So mm. anyway, fast forward. So now I'm in Olympic Studios in London. There's a documentary that came out on, on the Stones called 25 Times 5, and we're recording. And I'm watching on television. I got Keith next to me here and Mick over there, and they're watching themselves for, on BBC television on this documentary, <laughs> right? Phone rings, bling, it's Will Calhoun. <laughs> and he contacts me, and he says, hey, Doug, man, I'm coming on. You know, we're thinking about doing a bass change. I knew he was doing a drum clinic. I said, but man, I'm, you know, we're going to be auditioning bass players. Would you be, um, would you be interested in, in coming and doing the audition? I'm in London. Yeah, I said, sure. So Charlie Watts and everybody are like, yo, Dougie, that'd be, that'd be kind of cool, man. So they're all in goosing me on and stuff. I'm like, cool. So I go over and do the audition. Out of fairness, they auditioned a bunch of bass players. And they had one gig that was still in the books. It was a gig in Brazil. And they hadn't, you know, and you know how they say things happen in threes? I got a call from Bruce Springsteen's people, Debbie Gold, from Seal, who I was working with already at that time, and from Will. Will called me first. Yeah. Seal offered me the gig as an MD. Debbie Gold from Bruce Springsteen would have been a tour, but I always honor whoever contacts me first. So, so that's kind of great how I integrity, am. and that's what I did. Great so integrity. fast forward, you know, next thing you know, I'm at we do the gig in Brazil, and after the first gig we did in Brazil, I got offered to join Living Color, and that's kind of the condensed story of it. <laughs> well, it's fantastic. What I had heard the band, I love the connection between you and Will. Thanks. There really is this fantastic trust and respect at such a high level and it's always exciting 
How do you figure that out? Where did that come from? Listening. Will was a huge fan of the stuff that I've done. Mm. He grew up listening to Pumpkin, who was yeah. a, DJ, a drummer. And yeah. Pumpkin was, we're, we're, Pumpkin and I came from the same vibe because, you know, we were both cutting hip-hop. Yeah. When cats yeah. were cats weren't digging hip hop. A lot yeah, of musicians yeah, were yeah. like, "Nah, man, why are you doing that?" But Pumpkin and I were mates. But I didn't I didn't know Will Calhoun at the time. Mm. But I knew Pumpkin because he came by the studio, come up in this little, you know, his car, and yeah. driving real slow, <laughs> put me in the car. Like, hey, Doug, man, check this out. So we were mates. Yeah. You know, so I was because I was down with the the hip hop scene hardcore. So I'm producing this band called the Booyah Tribe out of L.A. Samoan rappers. And at that time, Living Color is, in, is playing. They're put on. They're doing the second. They're, they're already like, this had to be 91. So the guys, I'm, you know, I'm producing the record. And Tal Bergman's playing drums on it. Tal, sure. Tal, you know. Anyway, so it got George Clinton on the slide, Stone, and yada, yada, yada. So the guy's like, yo, man, we like Living Color, man. I said, I know the guys. Let's go see him. And, uh <laughs> the Palladium and took him to the Universal, whatever. So they, they were like, cool, you think we can get Vernon to come in and play some guitar? Yeah, no problem. Call Vernon if he comes in and plays guitar. And then Will and I, Will's being very encouraged. Hey, man, I'm, I'm, I'm available. I'd like to play some drums. I I'd really, I don't even know if we've even played together before. I'm like, okay, cool. I like Will's vibe. So I was trying, I scheduled to get Will to come in to play drums on the track. But I think they were, they were, it was just a schedule thing. So he couldn't really do it because they were going off to Arizona or whatever. But I managed to get Vernon and, and Corey. So, the, so Will's like, what are, you know, he's like, hey, man, I want to do it. And I'm like, cool, I got you, brother. So that's kind of how it started. Interesting. And then he was a Tackhead fan and all the other hip-hop stuff, so we never really got a chance to play. Mm -hmm. But I played with Vernon and also produced a song with Corey. We did a, we did a version of, with Mitch Goldman, uh, Tell Me Something Good. We did a version that was Tackhead feature with uh, Living Color Fusion that was kind of put together. Yeah, yeah. And we did that over in London. Flew Corey over there and we did a hang and stuff like that. So I'd already been, I already knew Vernon, worked with Corey. Will was the only missing link. Hmm. You know, Will and I got tight. You know, I, he comes in, I go to go do the audition. I had about three days, you know, four days or whatever. Cause I went to go see Will do the, do the drum clinic in London. So, yeah, man, next week we're gonna, you know, start the auditions. So cool, so they were like, okay. So I'll never forget this, so I fly in. It must have been, it was October 31st, 1991, <laughs> Halloween. I flew into a hurricane. If you look at the record, there was a hurricane going on at that time, staying at the Omni Hotel. They fly me in. So I had a few days to prep up. So in situations like this, what I do, Dom, is I'm like, okay. They, they had the Vivid record, you know, the Time's Up, Biscuits. So I go, okay. In a situation like this, I learned the, probably one of the, I try, to, I try to learn the craziest song and the most difficult song first. Cult was, was okay, so I learned Time's Up. So let's do Time, something that, like that, that'd yeah. be kind of like really kind of like, you know, challenging. So go to the rehearsal at a spot out in Queens. Okay, Doug, what do you want to do? Okay, well, um, I'm, you know, I'm prepared. You know, I got, you know, I learned these songs, that song, learned everything. Record time, actually. So let's do Time's Up. Silence in the room. <laughs> I'm like, did I say something wrong here? <laughs> There's silence between Vernon, Corey, and, and Will. Guys stop and they go, I said, is, is something wrong? I said, you're the only one that wanted to do that song. <laughs> Nobody else wanted to play the song. Let's do it. So we hit it and, you know, it was just one of those things where we just naturally hit it off. Hmm. You know, drummers and bass players have a thing. Yeah. You know, you learn from each other. So one of the things that I did with Will and the guys after I got in the band, the first thing I wanted to do was work to a click. Because I noticed that there were these, you know, like you get playing too fast, it's part of the music. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. You're playing too slow, yeah. it's different tempos here, and, that, and, it, and it's okay. But playing to a click, not everybody can do that. A lot of bands will avoid doing that. Yeah. But, the, but it's great for it when you want to edit. And because I've been in the studio so many years, I understand the advantage of playing with the click. And I also understand how you, it is to not play with a click as well. Okay. Yeah. But stability. Mm -hmm. So we started playing with the drum machines, Will and I. It's just because he knew the stuff that I was doing, the tack head stuff, and I'm working with the band, I'm working with samples. And yeah, in order to make the samples align in time, and to do certain things, because I was playing all these things that I did, then you have to have some sort of form, yeah. you know, yeah. or else it's just going to be, you know, and then you, you find a way to train yourself to be able to play to the different tempos. Yeah. And a lot of times it's easier to play fast, but play slow. Yeah. 
Big play blue. Play slow. You'll be surprised how many people can count, are, are good at time. For example, when I'm playing with the Stones, with Charlie Watts, people don't realize how good of a meter Charlie Watts yeah. has. So, for example, you can play. We do games like, okay, play the track. You keep counting, all right? So, and then drop out the drums. Put the drums back in 10 seconds later. You'd be surprised how far off the rhythm, yeah. or a click, how far off yeah. people are. Yeah, sure. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So just simple tests like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And it's, and it's just, it's, it's called, it's a tune-up. Yeah. It's a rhythm tune-up. It's a sonic <laughs> tune-up that you kind of need. So, and what does that do? Everybody has a different way that they hear rhythm. Now, Living Color is a very diverse, you know, band. And I saw that there could be a good asset as well of how we can maybe merge in some of the stuff that has, you know, when we're, when we're working with samples and certain things. Because Will's playing, Will would trigger a pad. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, why is that not coming in on time, all the time? If we, want, if we want it to be like that, that's cool. But it'd be good if we could maybe find a way how to stable, lock make that, in, yeah. lock it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if we don't want to do it, then we have that as another asset right, as well. Right. It's not like do that. It's just, it's just part of, it's more, more in your arsenal. So that's the first thing I started doing with Will is running with, playing with a clip. But well, what amazing because it really has locked you guys in the drum machine, not necessarily a clip, but just drum machines. You could hear the, you could hear the, you could now you can walk between the rhythms. Now you can swagger your way yeah, yeah. from any click because if something's going like that, I can still go click, 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 or I can be click, 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 <laughs> click. Those were some of the stepping stones of how we got tight. Well, it's amazing as I talk to yourself and as I've spoken to Will, just the the fact that you guys are open-minded to an incredible degree. That sequence control is really an extremely powerful skill to have playing live or in studio at all times. Yes. At all Thank times. You. Where did the Native American thing come in? Okay, well, I'm Native American. Throughout my whole life, I've been hearing things, yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of like that spirit of the soul. You know, for me, it came in, you know, early at an early age, just listening to, you know, the, the wind and listening to us, the rivers and, yeah, and stuff yeah. and the sound and, you know, and emulating kind of like these sounds that you hear. Over time, you know, listening to different indigenous artists. And I look at the indigenous artists as very diverse. And, and you know, so whether it's coming from, you know, New Orleans and listening to the Chapatulas Indians, and or the Neville brothers and yeah. stuff that they've been able to do yeah. from their native from from their ancestry and and, the, and that that gumbo of different bloodlines all merging in starting at the Mississippi River, you know it, it, it all it all started to come alive to me. Listening to the blues, to me is in. Indigenous, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's ancestral. It's coming from Africa. It's coming from South America. It's coming the slave ships, the routing that they took, you know, where they dropped folks off at. And every, so I kind of, I, I assemble that all as part of this nat as native nice. and indigenous. Nice. It's not necessarily broken down into one area. It's a, it's a global thing because there's, there's the Aboriginal music that's going on over there. There's that music that's coming from Africa, South America. Yeah, you know, all over Europe because people were put all over the place. Yeah. My people were spread all out. Absolutely. And the history of what took place, it just in this country, you know, with Native American Indians, you know, and how they were, you know, what took place, you know, how how the tribes were divided and how the, the slaves that were brought over here, you know, how they split up the, the, the men and sent the men off there and left the women there and kind of like next thing you know, the slaves run away, where'd they go? They hung out with the Indians and who, who are the black, my ancestors and the slaves hooking up with the, hooking up with the Native American uh, women. Yeah. So like most people, uh, my color or whatever, you know, if you go back to the 1800s, you know, they're gonna have a Native American grandmother hmm. in there just based on how the history of everything kind of went down. So just recently, I just, you know, a couple of days, I just w was able to get another awakening, mm -hmm. you know, because I've always been like involved, just kind of like feeling the spirits. But, you know, I was just on the road. I just did a show recently this last weekend in Whitehorse, Canada, mm -hmm. in the in way up north, 700 miles um, just uh, east of Anchorage, Alaska. So there, I was working with Stevie Silas, who's an Apache Indian. Right. His ancestors are uh, he's Apache heritage. And Bernard Fowler and his family, he's 
he has Native, he has Native American from us, uh, uh, North Carolina uh, Indians that were there, and mine come from the, from the Caribbean, and you know, and Carib Indians, or from the Blackfoot Indians, and yada yada. <laughs> so, Stevie Silas just did a documentary called Rumble, and it's just a fascinating story about the influence of Native American Indians in rock and roll, hmm. whether it's coming from Robbie Robinson, you know, that you know, from the Canadian vibe, Link yeah. Gray who was one of the first kind of like, you know, guitar players that was, you know, that Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page would, were listening to and stuff like that. <laughs> Check it out, it's called Rumble, it'll be out next year. So I guess my spirits just came alive. In this documentary, there's conversations with Little Steven, mm. Martin Scorsese, Quincy Jones, Steven Tyler, the list goes on and on and on and on. But it makes, it's not, it's not only is it talking about Native American uh, musicians that made a huge influence, it's really like a history lesson. Yeah. It's really something that should be in every, in my opinion, in American schools uh, for a uh, curriculum. Absolutely. And Absolutely. this is something that it was like an awakening. What better place could, could it take place than in Whitehorse? in the Yukon in Canada. So now I'm kind of like really interested in really kind of like deep diving into supporting the Native American frequencies. Let yeah. me just put it like that. Yeah, beautiful. Just the frequencies. I, I'll I, leave it like that. I love this kind of research because this is really what we have found, even here at the Sessions panel. These young kids are watching this and they're looking for information. They're stepping into your world now. They're, all the names that you're mentioning, I want them all to do the research. Go do the research of every single name that you have mentioned. When you mention a West Montgomery, they have to know who that is sure. to understand where you go back to what right. you listen to. In closing, we have these young students that are listening. What would you say to this next generation that you can give them advice for them, for them to, they have this passion, they want to be involved in the music industry. Doug, what can you give them advice? Find an elder that you can listen to. Nice. And here's something I like to, I like to chime in on. I and my wife, Diane Nielsen, we do an event called the Wind Bash. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is trying, is making this connection between the elders and the next generation, nice. these kids. And what we do is, and this started years ago, it started off by, my name is Wimbish, it's spelled Wimbash. Sometimes people spell my name wrong. Yeah. And, I said, and you know, I said, okay, well, if I ever do an event, I'm gonna call it a Wimbash, because my name's always spelled wrong. <laughs> and then, you know, I have elders that turn me on, and I'm here because of my elders. Absolutely. I'm not the architect, I'm the recipient. So one day, it became a situation where I have a lot of folks that I grew up with, and I see them now, and they're like, you know, Going, I see my guitar center, they're, just, they're not playing anymore. Hey, Doug, can we do something? Hey, I don't like hollow conversation. I'm like, maybe one day. And there was a local club in my community that had, had events going on. And he was like, hey, man, why don't you do something here? Cool. And then it was like, okay, my friend, my mentor, that got me in the industry, Skip McDonald, was, we were all living in London. He came back home. I wanted to give him a party. So at this party, it was like, you know what? Let me find some of, the local, some of my old friends that are still doing something that have the, but they're still playing, but they have no way to actually play because it bands are fizzled out. These folks have died, whatever. I'm like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Let me get the uh, some of my old friends together, and also, where's the young kids that are playing right now? Yeah. Who are these kids that are out there in the community? Let's get them together so that they get the opportunity to hear from the elders, you know, and play on the same stage with the elders. So I, we, I created this event. It was an, it's an I thing right now. Diana, we, she, she came on a few years later, but we're all doing it right now. So I put together, a, just get everybody together mm -hmm. and put old school, just get everybody together so you could just break bread, have fun. And it wasn't just the elders that I was working with. I also brought in my mother. I would go to, up to she's in a home, for the day, and I go and let's get the let's get the elders to come and in a wheelchair and bring Beautiful. them to have a family Beautiful. event. Beautiful. So it started off kind of like they have a family event. So now the kids are able to play with some of the elders, and it, that's how this whole fusion started. So I noticed that at, at that point it was like you know what, people really dug it. So let's do this. Let me start to find a way how to even make it even deeper. So we started having these Wimbash events. And, I st and we started to say, okay, 
let's also have an, you know, have a gig at night where we can let the, you know, kids play with the elders. But during the afternoon, we can set up, set up a recording environment so they can actually learn how to play a little bit. But then I'd also have my attorney come in, teach them a little <laughs> bit about music law, or Alan Friedman would come in and talk to them about, you know, just economics and stuff yeah. like that. Just talk to them about, you know, ways and means to, to connect. And, it's, and turn the iPad off. These are things, to, you know, turn the phone off. The devil's in that screen. Turn that <laughs> off for a minute. And then let's just have a good old school conversation. And kids are very, they're, 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 they're simple, man. You know, like, in order to connect to a kid, so, uh, it's simple. I would say, okay, eight-year-old kid, who's he going to listen to? A 12-year-old. Okay, you teach that. Ha hang out with that kid. Who's a 12-year-old going to listen to? 17-year-old. 17-year-old, hang out with the 12-year-old. Who's a 17-year-old going to hang out with? Probably 25-year-old. And Just <laughs> kind of like, just find a way so that you're in the same dynamic Beautiful. and the same range. Beautiful. So over the years, and with my, my, my Mrs. Diane, we found a way how to just keep connecting the dots, have these events. I'm kind of like an ambassador to the School of Rock. And we just have, the, we've had 53 Wimbashes over like, a, I don't know, it's going on maybe 14 years. Fantastic. So this is my contribution. My, it's, it's like, roll your sleeves up, connect the dots, bring the kids together. The, the guy that's just getting off of a Learjet, get him in there so that he can look in the eyes of this young kid and remember what that was like. But you, you guys talk and share and play and also we raise money to go into the community and gift some instruments mm -hmm. to organizations. We find the local heroes that are in the community and we say, okay, what do you, you write us, tell us what you need. And then I reach out to my sponsors, get gear, and then we'll go, okay, here's some equipment for you, but it's not gifted to you. You guys, here's, we just gifted 30 ukuleles to the school of uh, uh, to Wilbur Cross High School Fantastic. West in New Haven. Fantastic. Okay, but here's the deal. We're not just going to give this to you. We want you to go, some of those kids, go to a community center, go to an old folks home and play. Right. you got to do some community service. Nothing's coming for free. Right. So that's the short story of, of it all. But if you really want to know the deep dive, wimbash.org is a place you can do it. That's my story. That's, my, that's our contribution to what we're doing. I can go deep dive, but really, at the end of the day, it takes only a moment to get. It's that little spark yeah. that happens in a kid's for a kid. All it takes is a spark. There's one little bit of a spark, your little bit of time that can make a huge difference. I know it did for me. <laughs> Wimbash.org. Wimbash.org. And, and, and you'll see all the information there. Living Colors performed that. Many, many artists have, have done it over the years. I have, you know, um, all of my sponsors have been able to chime in and it's just growing. It's an event and it's something that is, it's our, it's, I'm doing the best, we're doing, I'm doing what we can. It's not a me thing, it's a we thing. I do it with my wife, Diane Nielsen, and other folks. We, we've done it in Anchorage, Alaska, Cabaret de Dominican Republic. We've actually, I'll leave you with this, we went down there. There's an organization called the Dream Project. It's like a Montessori set up in Cabaret de Dominican Republic, teaching kids, taking kids off the streets and stuff and helping to give them a, an education. In, in Dominican Republic, they have a very not so good education system. It's yeah, one of the yeah. worst in the Western Hemisphere. Yeah. They, can, they can play baseball. The baseball teams put a lot of money there, but some of the kids can't spell baseball. Yeah. So I went down there, got into the vibe with Eric Gales. And we went and did a little thing at one of the schools. While we were at the school, Eric and I performed, you know, just playing, you know, simple little songs. It inspired one of the teachers that was there to say, hey, man, I love what you guys did. We did a concert and everything with the kids. This one teacher bought six guitars. We go back, the next guy calls up and says, hey, man, I was so inspired by what you and Eric did. Now I bought some guitars. Now I want you to come back next year. Now he's got six students playing. The next year we came back, Beautiful. we sent some gear down there. Beautiful. Short, the, end of, the short story is now there's 250 kids that have gone through this, this music program that we, that we started. Two of those kids are in the Dominican Republic Conservatory right now Fantastic. just by going and attending. So these are some of the things that we're doing in real time Beautiful. to help. Beautiful. You know, Beautiful. that's it. You and Diane are making a difference. We're a, making a difference. A, you too, Dom. A powerful difference. And amazing enough is now... You are one of those elders. Yeah. And now that takes the next journey. Doug, thank you so much. Thank you, brother. <laughs> thank Fantastic. You. I appreciate you.